We'll get started with a, a panel here in a second, but I wanted to uh, give an opportunity for President Watkins to say a, a couple words uh, about what, uh, what we're doing today and how this fits in with the university. So, President Watkins. Thank you. So, thank you very much. I think the most important message that I want to send is one of gratitude. What a powerful gathering of leaders from our campus in a variety of roles, scholars, researchers, uh, individuals who staff and lead how our campus works and functions, and many partners in the community. This is truly a 1U effort on an important societal issue, really a grand challenge for our community locally and for the world as we think about air quality, its impacts on health and well-being, and what we can do about it as a powerful model for the rest of the world. I'm delighted to have the chance to thank Jim Agutter and others who made this great day possible, to our guests and visitors who have joined us in this conversation, and to every one of you, please know that I appreciate your time and your ideas and uh, really wish you a very productive dialogue. The stakes are pretty high. This work really matters. Thank you for being part of it today. All right, so with that, uh, great thanks. Uh, I'll set the stage for uh, what I'm sure will be a really interesting panel. And I'm just going to go through and introduce everyone very quickly with their titles. And then they will have five minutes to present some of their work. And then there'll be a broader dialogue with a, a moderator and then opening up for conversation. Uh, so we have Steve Bannister, who is an associate professor, lecturer in economics, and the director of Miage uh, in, in social and behavioral science. We have Tabitha Benny, assistant professor in political science. Logan Mitchell, research assistant professor in atmospheric sciences. And Cheryl Perosi, uh, assistant professor clinical in pulmonary, pulmonary medicine. And then we have Brenda Bowen, who is the director of global change and Sustainability Center, thank you, GCSE. I know it from the acronym. Uh, and so we'll first start off with Steve, who will give a little introduction to, to his work. I'm gonna stand up if that's okay. Yeah, of course. And, oh, good. Yep. Okay, um, thanks very much for the organizers and Dr. Thurston, wherever he is, for uh, sort of dragging us out of our comfort zones and doing you know, a very great presentation. I hope you will share your slides. So I'm um, Steve Bannister, Department of Economics, um, and therefore I'm an economist, and therefore I'm a social scientist. So one of those softy scientists. However, I love hanging out with the, the North Campus disciplines, the science and engineering folks, and I do that whenever I can. Uh, as, an, as an economist, I do models. Um, my models produce lots of graphs, <laughs> and I, I'm only going to be able to show a couple in, inside of my five minutes. Um, the models I've been working on most recently, actually for quite a while, are designed to capture all of the important structural variables that impact climate change. So those are, in, in my model, uh, population. Population levels as they change, that's very important. Living standards, how much we all consume. Energy consumption, which is thermodynamically required for any kind of economic output. And the carbon intensity of our, of our energy sources. Now, increasingly, these, this kind of modeling, very integrated modeling, is called E3 for energy, economy, and environment. And to that, I add P for population, so I don't know if I'm going to call it P3, that's probably not right, E3 plus P, something, something, we'll have to name it. Um, and I've been doing mainly uh, global modeling for most of my work, but I've recently brought the, this modeling down to the Utah level, and that's what I'm going to share with you in the last two minutes here. So. Uh, I do, there are a lot of parameters in this model that you need. I'm going to show you just a couple. 
And here's the most important one for climate change and for our local air quality problems, and that's the carbon intensity, how much carbon is in every unit of energy that goes into the system. This is for Utah. I've recently done it with a local nonprofit uh, to, uh, to bring the model down to the Utah level. And we can see, this goes back to 1990, this is all the data I had, through 2015, and it's a little noisy, that's probably just measurement stuff, but for the first half of that period, it was fairly level. The carbon intensity was not improving. So our, we were still having a highly carbon intense energy source or combination of energy sources here in Utah. But after that, it started uh, declining pretty nicely. I'll caution that the scale is a, is a little out, uh, so the actual percentage decreases aren't that great. But you, you get the sense. I don't know what caused that. I'd love to know. And I'm going to go to the second slide. When I take that intensity and some of the other parameters in the model, I forecast. I go out into the future. And I do it because the IPCC does it, and that forces us to go further than you're comfortable. But after, at the end of the day, here's a forecast for Utah carbon dioxide emissions or flux out through 2065. And um, Right now, so that's our contribution, our Utah contribution to the uh, carbon dioxide you know, caused greenhouse gas problem we have. My next step in this um, modeling, I hope, what I hope to be able to do is to get enough data on local uh, precursors to the regional haze and the, uh, the dirty air problem we have here, so the nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, all those things, PM25, get enough of a time series data on that so I can do the same kind of analysis locally that impact the local air quality. So that's my next step. I'm going to probably need some help in order to, to uh, gather that data from maybe from atmospheric sciences or some others. So. And then finally, this didn't come out very well, but there's sort of a list of what goes in the model. It's a pretty simple model. It's a very different model than most most economists work with in this space, and it has many virtues because of that. But it's very comprehensive. And in fact, um, uh, Dr. Thurston mentioned Paul Ehrlich, and this model that I use is actually an outgrowth of one of the early 1970 models that Ehrlich and Holdren did. So, um, so I, I look very much forward to bringing additional information to the Utah level. Thanks very much. Well, for coming today. Obviously, this is an important issue for many of us. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, discussing what I'm presenting today. This is actually uh, the early results of the Utah Social and Behavioral Sur Survey on air quality. It's actually um, a interdisciplinary team of researchers that got together from BYU and the University of Utah. And we're grateful to both institutions for supporting this research. In particular, I'd like to say thank you to the Nexus Center and also to GCSC for supporting the final stages of this project. So the impacts of air quality, of course, to everyone are, are an important challenge here in Utah. Uh, but a lot of research in the social sciences tell us that it's not just technology or even funding or other types of political uh, organization that are required to move this problem in important directions. But instead, for real progress to advance, individual behavioral change is also an important factor. This raises an important issue because across the social science and the research that uh, we study, it shows that environmental values or concern about air quality aren't actually enough to, to move individual behaviors. Um, we actually have to move even the staunchest environmentalists. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, every one of us in this room makes decisions that are actually counter to uh, good air quality. We saw that with the poll that was done early this morning. This can result from a variety of reasons, a lack of perfect information, changing scientific data, um, uncertainty, other, other factors that are just part of the human condition. 
But the good news is that if we understand the actual underlying mechanisms around behavior, we can actually make some important changes. And I want to talk a little bit about that and how it applies to Utah. So to try and grapple with the underlying mechanisms that can play a part in air quality behavior, our team put together a, um, an interdisciplinary behavioral survey. We have seven hypothesized drivers of environmental values and beliefs that we put together and we've uh, begun to analyze today. Everything from environmental values and political orientation to things like parental, uh, parental size or parental income, uh, spatiality, and even religious values have a factor of importance in a state like Utah. Uh, we use, as I said, a behavioral survey, and our goals are really to mot motivate action and to try and translate that action into behavioral movement or environmental change. So I'm going to give you some uh, early examples from our work. Uh, first of all, some good news. Uh, for Utahns, when asked, uh, to what degree can we change air pollution levels in Utah, about 80% of the population that we survey from across the state, from every income and race and uh, sort of uh, area of Utah, we got a really great response. About 80% of Utahns believe that we can make substantial change to the air quality issue. Um, but unfortunately, there are some misperceptions that come along with many of the beliefs that we underscored in the remainder of the survey. So, for example, uh, when we asked if air pollution is human caused, at least a third of Utahns still believe that air quality problems that we face in our state are actually natural. Um, we all know that there can be different types of natural air pollution, like volcanic eruptions. Uh, but it's well established that human behavior is the big factor here. Um, it's the largest com contributor to, to air quality. But what's more essential about the findings of this survey were that the groups that sort of uh, believe that human behavior was, uh, was not really at play tend to come from very strong voting and consumer populations in Utah, um, especially male populations above the age of 35. And what was so crucial about that is they tended to influence others in their household in very important ways. So even if others in their homes believed uh, that air quality was an important factor, they were less, uh, less likely to act on their behavior because of the other influence in their, in their homes. Um, we also asked about short-term air quality impacts, and although many people thought the long-term impacts were important, we were surprised to find out that a big portion, about 45% of the population in Utah, were either unsure or they were not concerned about short-term impacts from air quality. Dr. Thurston showed us that that's actually not the case, that we should have much more concern for these problems. And then last but not least, when we think about the use of government policy for making a change in Utah, we were quite shocked to find that a good portion, almost half of the population in Utah, were unsure if government should be involved in changing this policy. And another 30% felt that government should not be involved in this process. However, unified action is something that um, has been shown time and time again to produce the best outcome. And we simply can't allow individuals to voluntarily get on board around air quality. And that's simply not the solution that will provide the best outcome. So Dr. Thurston stole some of my thunder here, but there's some important perceptions and misperceptions about air quality in Utah that still need to be changed. The technology and the science aren't enough to move us in that important direction. So while many U Utahns were unsure about government action, public policy in this area is well established. Um, in addition, educational institutions like the U are essential for educating and producing the good science that'll get us to move forward. And last but not least, Behavioral change will not come without trade-offs. Uh, the incentives that help people to move towards these changes are just as important, and we need to be thinking those through as well. Thank you very much. OK, my name is Logan Mitchell. I'm in Atmospheric Sciences. Thank you for, for having us as part of this discussion. Um, we're going to talk about air quality data and modeling for science and policy applications, just to give a quick, quick overview. We really live in a data-rich environment right now. We have many data sources coming from, for example, the Division of Air Quality, Citizen Science, and the research that we're doing on here. Each of these different networks of environmental monitoring have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, and I'm going to you know, put these up here uh, and just talk about it briefly. You know, some of them have more extensive networks and some have uh, less, but and there's different levels of quality of these different uh, stations. And we're doing really essential work trying to understand the pros and cons. Um, in the atmospheric science department, we have weather and air quality 
measurements and modeling capabilities and i wanted to just talk about some of the exciting things that we're doing to advance that we're one of the we're focused on developing these novel monitoring strategies to address these questions and as an example of that we've put uh, instruments on uh, several tracks trains which are driving around collecting air quality data uh, as we speak um, we have the longest running urban greenhouse gas network of any urban area in the world uh, and that was you know we, we've we've done a lot of research with that we've as you mentioned earlier uh, we've equipped several Google Street View vehicles with uh, air quality instrumentation. Uh, we even have air quality instruments on the KSL chopper. So we're getting regular vertical profiles every time the, the chopper is out uh, collecting news stories. I just wanted to briefly show some of the data to give you a sense of what it looks like. This is carbon dioxide that's been averaged over a year, measured along the tracks lines. And you can see really characteristic patterns. You can see intersections. You can see the structure of, of the city. You can see where it's uh, more elevated in downtown. There's a lot of things that go into these spatial patterns. Here's methane. It's a very different spatial pattern, really characterized by emissions from point sources and industrial facilities. Uh, ozone looks very similar to carbon dioxide. Uh, it's really uh, you know, a, f a function of fossil fuel emissions across the city that give this spatial pattern. You can even look down the I-15 corridor and you can see where uh, the nitrogen oxides that are emitted from traffic actually draw down ozone right along the freeway. And this is the chemistry that's going on that we're trying to understand. And of course, particulate matter is, is uh, of a lot of interest here. And we're measuring that as well. And so this is the characteristic pattern uh, during an inversion when you have elevated PM levels at the center of, of the valley. You know, this, this sort of data can be coupled with um, health records to understand the spatial impacts of health impacts uh, across the city. And we're, we would like to partner with the rest of the university to make, to advance those sorts of studies. Um, this is also of a lot uh, relevant to uh, policymakers. And, um, and of interest to policymakers. As an example, several cities have made commitments to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Here's Salt Lake City, Park City, and Cottonwood Heights uh, targets. And, and they're interested in understanding how this data can help inform their strategies and their progress towards these goals. And of course, the Utah legislature in 2018 uh, passed HCR 7 um, with uh, bipartisan majorities in the House and Senate. Um, this is on environmental stewardship and environmental and economic stewardship um, addressing, as you mentioned, um, air quality and the changing climate. This, this is actually a really great bill. If you haven't read it yet, you should go check it out. But I just wanted to highlight uh, one of the sections of, of the bill. They said they should prioritize understanding and the use of sound science to address causes of the changing climate. Um, and support innovation and environmental stewardship in order to realize positive solutions. So they, the, the, our policymakers see a role for sound science in, in informing these decisions going forward. And that has really been put into place. As, as mentioned, um, the Chem Gardner Policy Institute is now uh, working on this, has an air quality and changing climate technical advisory committee. Um, Dr. Prozzi and myself and, and several others are involved in this, in this group. Um, but some of the priorities in, in, and um, principles of this are that it's data-driven. Uh, the, the interventions that we talk about are going to be data-driven and grounded in science. And positive solutions, recognizing that air quality improvements, highlighting air quality improvements because they inspire public consensus and urgency um, to address these issues. Um, and this is of great interest to folks. There's been, there's been lots of, of news about it already, and there's, and there's more coming out. And it's great to be that we as a, as, the, as a research community can be engaged in this process. And wanted to mention also that later tonight, this conversation is going to continue. Um, I'm going to be on a panel with uh, Mayor uh, Silvestrini from Mill Creek, uh, Mayor Peterson from Cottonwood Heights, and Mayor Bradburn from Sandy, discussing, discussing uh, stewardship of air and climate. Um, in addition to um, um, uh, Brigham Daniels, who's from BYU, and also Piper Christian, who's a sophomore at the University of Utah. She's one of the um, students who, as a high school student, passed HCR 7 through the Utah legislature. So it's really great to be on a panel with her. So I wanted to mention that. Thanks.
Hi, I'm Cheryl Perosi. I'm a pulmonologist. Uh, my research is focused on the health effects of air pollution, but I've been asked to sort of back up and talk a little bit briefly and more broadly about health effects of climate change. Um, this is a slide from the CDC um, that I'll go through just real briefly. Um, in the center, you have some of the main effects of climate change, rising temperatures, more extreme weather, sea level rising, and increased CO2 levels. And then surrounding that are some of the exposures that result from that and then some of the subsequent health effects. Just to touch on a few of them, um, increasing temperatures lead to increasing season and geographical distribution of mosquitoes and other disease carrying vectors. So this has led to increasing incidence of Lyme disease in West Nile. Um, climate change is leading to increased pollen concentrations as well as longer pollen seasons. So this leads to more allergic disease and asthma exacerbations. Um, heat itself has a number of specific health effects. So um, heat stroke, deaths due to heat stroke, but also increased hospitalizations for respiratory, cardiovascular, and cerebrovascular disease. Um, and then there's many health effects of severe weather events, flooding, and hurricanes. Um, I'm going to talk more about air pollution now. So the effect of climate change on air pollution is complex, and it does vary quite a bit uh, in different regions. Uh, but these are just a few of the ways that climate change would be expected to affect air quality. Um, so warmer temperatures lead to increased production of ground level ozone. Um, and then more frequent and extreme wildfires lead to increased particulate pollution, but also some of the other components of wildfire smoke, um, some of which are ozone precursors. So ozone air pollution has been associated with a number of health effects, uh, reduced lung function, uh, probably development of asthma with long-term exposure, respiratory admissions uh, and ED visits for respiratory disease, uh, pneumonia and respiratory infections, and then strokes, arrhythmias, um, exacerbations of pulmonary disease like asthma, COPD, and cystic fibrosis. And then both long and short-term exposure are associated with increased mortality, uh, respiratory, cardiovascular, and all cause. Um, so just locally, to touch on a few studies, um, to try to understand the mechanism for these health effects, we did a study using exhaled breath condensate, which is shown in that little picture there, but it's a non-invasive way of looking at breath and measuring markers of inflammation and oxidative stress. So we looked at former smokers on high ozone pollution days um, as well as clean air days. Um, and you can see on the figure there, both COPD patients and our controls had significantly higher um, exhaled breath condensate NOx as a marker of inflammation and oxidative stress um, on the ozone pollution days. There are many health effects of particulate pollution, so wildfire smoke specifically uh, is associated with asthma and COPD exacerbations, pneumonia, cardiovascular uh, illnesses, and increased all-cause mortality. And then for PM2.5, there's so much data on health effects. Um, respiratory disease like pneumonia and bronchiolitis, cardiovascular disease like heart attacks and heart failure, um, there's increased suicides, cognitive decline, preterm birth, and then both long and short-term exposure associated with increased mortality. And a lot of this uh, research has been done locally here. Um, so one study we did here was looking at short-term air pollution exposure on over 4,000 cases of pneumonia along the Wasatch Front. Our main finding was that for older adults, 65 and older, PM2.5 on the six days prior to presentation was associated with more cases of pneumonia, more severe pneumonia, and increased inpatient mortality. So this figure shows the odds ratio for diagnosis of pneumonia per 10 microgram per meter cube increase in PM2.5. Um, and lag day are the days prior to coming in with pneumonia. And then this is stratified by age, so green is the adult 65 and older. And so you can see that on each of the six days prior to presentation, uh, PM2.5 was associated with an increase odds for pneumonia diagnosis for those older adults. And the highest odds ratio was on lag day one uh, with a 35% increased odds. And we saw a similar pattern with severe pneumonia and inpatient mortality.
environmental change. I think of the you know, four and a half billion year evolution of our planet and change that's always going on and the surface and tectonics and climate and biology are all interacting and changing all the time to give us our, our current situation. But I know that I, I, the panelists here all sort of think about environmental change differently when we're thinking about you know, the compounding impact of climate change on air quality and, and what that will mean here in Salt Lake City, but also what environmental changes we might need in our community moving forward to see a positive future and a system where we're all thriving and our ecosystems are thriving. Um, and so I wonder if you could say a little bit about your perceptions of you know, what does environmental change mean from your disciplinary perspective. Uh, from Environmental change um, component seems to be most people model, or economists and others, environmentalists model what's called the damage function in their models. And you get a huge range of, of uh, outcomes in those models that it's going to decrease GDP on the sort of ridiculously low end of a few percentage points, four or five percentage points. Makes no sense to me. And going up to much higher, 30 or 40 percent decreases in, in GDP total output, which means our living standards would, would decline, um, you know, going forward into the future if those damage functions do, do in, in fact occur. So it's a big deal. It can be a very big deal. I, I'd be probably on the higher end of that those percentage ranges. So that there's been work done that actually sort of can demonstrate the, the economic benefit. On, on air so the better damage functions incorporate both the costs and benefits. So yes. So I'm a political scientist, uh, but also a political economist. I'm not that far off from Stephen in, in many ways. Um, but there's two sides to this point in political science that are important, and I think in many behavioral sciences. We understand on the one hand, um, the economic impacts, of course. Um, in Utah, when we think about air quality, we have to think about public health, we have to think about the cost of those over the long term, the loss in productivity, but we also have to think about the loss in um, tourism and other sorts of um, intellectual uh, causes that will be lost as a result of, of reduced air quality. However, in behavioral studies, we see time and time again that crisis is actually very useful for bringing about environmental change. So, um, you know, as we get to the point of crisis, we may actually improve our ability to make behavioral change in a state like Utah, where we might be make more resistant to be traditional in our approaches. Um, you know, a catastrophic event along the air quality route might be good in terms of political science and thinking about uh, bringing about change. Do we want to get to that point? Hopefully we won't have to uh, reach that point before we make those kinds of decisions that help us in the long run. When I think of environmental change, I'm thinking, I, I, the first thing I think about is what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, there have been a lot of efforts to improve air quality, and, and, and you know, there are, we are in the midst of a massive global economic and energy transformation, moving from fossil fuel produced energy to renewable energy sources. And that's going to affect many parts of our environment. And I'm really interested in having the ability to sense those changes and understand them and be able to provide policymakers input. And as an example of where this, you know, what should happen not working well was in the European Union as a way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, they promoted diesel. And that has resulted in massive NOx emissions and which, which resulted in really poor air quality. And so that was kind of a, a negative impact. And, and as we go forward, we need to be thinking about what are the chemistry, what are the chemical reactions that are going to change, how is how the chemistry of our atmosphere going to change in urban areas and around the world as as these economic and energy sources change. Um, I, I of course think about the health effects of environmental change, um, much of which I kind of was outlining there, but just thinking about the many different health effects of climate change, but um, probably we have the most data on the health effects of air pollution. Um, and so I just think that those health effects are very important to put into the calculation when we're measuring the cost of the of uh, change. Nice. Next question. 
question for my panelists, and hopefully you guys will be thinking of questions you might like to ask as well as we're moving forward. Um, so all of you are involved in some aspects of interdisciplinary research and this type of scholarship, and certainly that's something the Global Change and Sustainability Center has been excited to, to work with it. Um, what do you see as the, the needs or opportunities moving forward to advance our interdisciplinary scholarship here even more? What are some of the barriers or, or challenges that you might have experienced or ideas you have for what we could do even better here at the university? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, been, I've been very fortunate to uh, be involved in a lot of collaborative research with people from different parts of the university, atmospheric scientists, looking at health effects. So uh, I think, um, I don't know, I think anything we can do to bring people together with health outcomes researchers, with um, exposure scientists, and um, statisticians, and everything um, really seems to be the alpha of our uh, research. So I was actually trained in an interdisciplinary setting, um, even from the undergrad stage um, and sort of advancing. And I was actually surprised when I got here that the social scientists weren't as fully involved in that. And I think there's a lot that social scientists can actually add. Um, they have to go out there, though, and show the scientists you know, what they have out there. And they have to be willing to learn the science. And that's an important factor. And I think the U has been doing and can continue to do a better job at bringing the young people in as young as possible giving them research opportunities, whether they come from communications or humanities, all the way through the different colleges on campus, and give them the opportunity to work in teams. Team science is really the way we solve these problems into the future, um, but we need people from every field and every sort of vocation to be able to be a part of that um, and to get buy-in across the university in that, in that way. So I really encourage getting you know, freshmen into these sort of teams and getting them trained in that way. Um, as I mentioned, I, I'd like to extend my modeling methodology to include all of the components of the air quality problem we have here in, in Salt Lake Valley. To do that, you know, these are time series, and you need quite a bit of data in order to make it at all relevant statistically. So, I'm, I, you know, I'm probably pretty quickly go to atmosphere science and uh, try to see how much data they have available. Uh, further, I've uh, been working with um, Daniel Mendoza and his team. We're starting to work with them on sort of the cost. What are the costs of these? You know, the medical, the morbidity, and, and mortality costs of these, the negative effects of the air quality problem. So I see lots of opportunities. So I'm thinking about how our local scientists and scientists in the really unique and special compared to what's happening globally or what thing, which things are really being worked on on a global scale and other places that we can transfer those solutions here and, and understand more about what, what people are doing elsewhere. Um, what do you think? How, how sort of unique and special is what's happening here in Salt Lake City with our air quality um, environmental change challenges versus what's happening on a global scale? So I originally was studying air quality in the, in the Kush region um, and working with people using uh, indoor cooking oils. Um, and when I arrived into Utah, and it took two or three years before I realized that the air quality here was what these people that I was flying far away to solve their problems was similar to. Um, the problem that we have here is a very serious one that many people uh, try to ignore on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we are seeing um, huge progress but it is a very serious issue and something that we as individuals can have a huge impact on. Um, so I would encourage everyone to you know, try and do their part and to think about their individual role, even baby steps of trying to move us all in that direction can have a huge impact on the current issue. Uh, in Atmosphere Science, we just actually hosted a big workshop called Aquarius uh, that was organized around a future uh, guilt campaign that's looking at the, the chemistry of the air quality problem here in Utah um, and comparing to other regions, because there are a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. And it's really under, um, one of the things, one of the motivating ideas that, that we, uh, of this workshop and this project is that um, over the last 
you know, 30 or 40 years, the Cleaner Act has resulted in improved air quality in many places across the United States. Um, but one of the places where it hasn't changed as much is in certain uh, mountain basins during the winter time. You can see that there's the particular matter in those regions is not going down. And so what it means is that there's policies that are pulling on emissions levers um, that are not impacting air quality. And, and what it means is that there's chemistry that we don't fundamentally understand or that they're not being accurately targeted. And so we're working on trying to understand those sorts of things and how that compares to other regions. Um, and I also say, kind of tying into the economics, you know, in economic terms, the negative externalities of, of air pollution. And I think that economic term describes why there's so much public interest in this. Because people perceive that they're having this negative impact on their health, and you know, they can understand that. Even if they're not you know, speaking the economic literature or, or understand those, those terms, they understand it on a, on a fundamental human level. Um, I'll, I'll just add, I think the, um, the economic literature is scientist <laughs> and, and, and my global model, first of all, the data, the amount of data I have in my models is overwhelming. It's massive. There's huge momentum in this global system we have. I, I haven't drawn that and, and the outcome in the medium term is not good. I'll just tell you that. In the longer term, there's actually a bit of better news, but that's way out for the end of the century. I don't know if We'll try before we get there. It must be something you know, dramatic. I suspect the same dynamics uh, occur on a local level. The amount of momentum, how hard it is to change the system. And I, I hate to be too negative about it, but there's also positives. We have to think really outside of the box in terms of where the research is going. Uh, replacing in carbon energy sources is zero. It has to go to zero. We don't do that. We are in trouble. So thinking about some shorter term solution focused ideas, um, there's discussion about Salt Lake possibly hosting the, the Winter Olympics, right, in 2030. And so we have a decade until the, until the world spotlight might be on us. Are there, are there changes you would love to see made in this decade? What would we want to do immediately to be ready for, for that in 10 years? Electrify all transportation. <laughs> if, if you look at the, the pie chart of our emissions, you know a lot of it comes from electricity production, a lot of it comes from uh, like for vehicles, transportation, um, and, and a lot of it comes from buildings. And if you think about the, the large the larger term trends that are going on right now, right now energy production from, from renewable energy, renewable sources are actually cheaper than that coming from coal. So there's powerful economic drivers pushing us towards renewable energy. It's cost competitive natural gas today. And those the prices of renewable energy are dropping and in five years they'll that, that change that it seems like every six months that changes. Um, electric vehicles right now are still emerging and I think that there's a, you know, if there is a push towards that, that will help accelerate that transition and it will generate benefits here locally immediately. Um, building electrification is still, I think, you know, the technologies are coming out, but they're not coming out quite as quickly, and it's and it's harder to justify retrofitting and older buildings. More, the, the the payback time is still long enough that it's a little hard. But that's coming also, and we could be putting in policies in place, looking at uh, things that for new building construction, because there's massive population growth. And, and, and so, so those, I, I see those three as, as being big issues that we as a research community and as, as, as people living in the community should be focused on. So one quick sort of follow-up to all of this is that really here in the United States, we, we 
have the opportunity, the resources, and the technology. Um, whether it's here in Salt Lake City or in any other city in the United States, it would be wonderful to see America leading um, on this sort of movement towards uh, you know, zero carbon footprint and, and all these sort of things we've talked about today. Um, America has the ability and really should be taking that leadership role, and that's the one thing that I would really like to see our country step forward, putting the important policies in place that we know are necessary and actually becoming the leader that we, we should be right now. I want to just, I, I completely agree, but I want to rephrase that a little bit and say that we are in the midst of this massive transition, and that means that there are massive economic opportunities, and the, and the folks that are leaders on this will realize those economic opportunities. And really, I think one of the questions that we should be asking ourselves is this is going to re result in lots of innovation, lots of new jobs, um, and do we want those jobs and those innovations to be created in China? or in Germany, or in California, or in Utah. And personally, I would rather have them be formed in Utah. So that's a, that's a really powerful argument um, that I've heard other people, other, other leaders in the state say that it resonates with them um, to you know, push forward on these as aggressively as possible. Do we have any questions for our panelists from the audience? Do we have a microphone? Yeah. yeah. One thing about air quality is it really has no boundaries. And so we focus a lot here at looking outside. And this is awesome if you turn around and look. And today, you'll be able to watch the transition of the photochemistry from sort of the brown stuff that we see in, as it goes through and generates secondary particulates. Uh, and so that will be going on. This one is just fantastic. But <laughs> the question actually is, is for the survey. Have you been able to break down sort of the responses for the rural communities versus urban? Because it really is a big issue across the state, which will actually resonate with legislators. It's not just an urban issue. I'm glad you said that. I didn't pay this man to ask me that question. <laughs> uh, the survey was actually inspired by that single notion, right? That, that maybe we can move people quite easily in Salt Lake City, but what happens in rural populations? Some of them which are generating the pollution that we have in our city. Um, and so we've actually uh, extended the study in order to be a large enough end to do a much better analysis on rural versus urban. We found there's actually six types of utahns, uh, and we are trying to actually draft a paper right now as we speak on this specific topic. We're finding uh, you know, very different uh, belief systems around different parts of Utah, not just in rural and urban, but in different rural populations themselves. And so we've made some really important connections. And at this point, I can tell you there are at least six different types of Utahns um, based off of their values and also their um, sort of economic conditions. Do I need a microphone? I had a question that I think that the juxtaposition of the economic argument and the health benefit argument and we all saw the, govern the governor last year came out with governor's budget and he proposed $100 million for air quality and I think we ended up with 30 or $40 million. And I think a lot of people see the cost of air pollution control being on industry and the benefit being on the public, but I think one thing that's not well properly discussed is the biggest cost to the state of Utah's budget is, or one of the biggest costs is Medicaid. And the cost of Medicaid is hugely driven by things like ER visits, as medicine. My husband works in healthcare and all he does is cost out Medicaid all day. And it seems like such an easy argument to say, well, if we reportion some of this funding from Medicaid to air quality, we actually save money. And I don't feel like, and that's all coming from the same edict. So I guess I'm wondering your guys' perspective on how well you think that's being analyzed politically and on a budget basis because I don't think that's well discussed, at least in the air pollution science community that I'm a part of. I think that's a, a great point. Um, you know, for one thing, I think it's hard to put a dollar sign on health in these slides. Um, but beyond that, I think it is helpful to do analysis of the economic costs of uh, these health outcomes, um, which is being done some. Uh, the, the pneumonia study that we did locally here that I presented it up we um, estimated um, about $800,000 in direct hospital costs associated with the CO2.5 exposure of both APA recommended levels um, for just those seven hospitals that we studied. Um, but I think, um, you know, that, I was surprised actually by how much that cost people's attention, more so than kind of the health uh, outcomes. And so I think that that is very valuable um, to 
So I, I totally agree with the points. Uh, they're very, uh, very important. However, the other side, and, and I often ask myself why uh, if you want to present with data, the rate of change in the right direction is not much faster than, than, you know, than it is. And when you start looking at the forces that are lined up opposing the change, it gets pretty overwhelming. This, and I think Dr. Thurston made that point. I'm going to emphasize it. There are really big, powerful, rich interest groups that um, who would get hurt by this, and we have to deal. We have to learn how to deal with them. And I, I mean, I've got a number of uh, thirty trillion dollars of, of uh, assets at risk in both the automobile, current automobile sector, and, and the petroleum sector. If we move to, to um, you know, sort of the totally clean energy at the end of the day, that, that's a lot of money. You're going to get a lot of pushback. We have to learn how to communicate with this. I have some other possible solutions, but I don't want to drag us into those right now. But we have to deal with the, with the very powerful forces that are out there that, that oppose change. Just to add a quick comment on that, you can oppose that with the how many trillions trillion of dollars of, of impacts from climate change and the but those are but that's the that's the those are the things that, that are way the harder to understand. So so related to that and, and related to her question or comment over there as well, of of changing like sometimes like the bottom line story of not like if we don't address climate change it's gonna be a catastrophe. It's when we address climate change or air quality, we're gonna improve like health, we're gonna reduce dollar cost. So changing into a positive spin so that people go, oh, I'm gonna save money by addressing this. Right? That's, I mean, a lot of times people, that's what resonates like, how are my taxes gonna be affected? How is this gonna affect, you know, the quarterly statement at the corporation, things like that, right? Which addresses this $30 trillion thing question. Um, and so then relate it to like these studies um, that have been done and that you have you know, we have air quality data going back, whatever, 30 years or so, is looking at those data going, because we did enact the Air Quality Act, we have saved this much money, right? We have saved this many lives. We've had a positive, great impact, right? How, how, so I, I would be naive to knowing the literature, but how often is that message told to policymakers and to the general public? Of, this is the positive impact that we have the data already. Mm, so I can't speak to actual numbers in that way, but as part of this survey, uh, we have been doing interviews with policymakers and others around this idea um, in terms of thinking about intellectual or cognitive frames that actually make people move. Um, thinking about environment or thinking about even air quality or lung cancer or using different words and sort of ways to frame these problems. And the one that moved everybody, regardless of political orientation, age, gender, et cetera, et cetera, was talking about the, the positive economic benefits. And in fact, um, moving and discussing about these things in ways that appeal to more a, a broader audience, um, trying to find outlets for large, special, or vested interest groups to be moving in a direction, helping them find those venues or avenues to get to those important things through different sort of cognitive frames can be one part step of actually moving us in this way and being positive about those economic benefits um, is a really important factor. We have time for one more question. So I have a question regarding policies that are in effect right now that students such as myself could possibly get behind. Um, I, well, I hear um, there's, there's crisis, uh, that there is a uh, monetary cost that has been discovered. Um, and from classes that I've taken, um, I understand that behavioral change um, can't usually um, happen without an incentive. So I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what policies uh, you can get behind. Um, that's that's 
you have good perception, let's see, for custom by now. Good perception, you're exactly right. The uh, I'm economist, right? So the most fundamental thing that I can communicate to everybody, my students and you, is that the, the one incentive that really changes everybody's behavior is large price differentials. Large price differentials. It goes to the points that Logan was making about the decreasing costs of renewables. Certainly true, however, the, the decrease, the de decreasing cost curves are flattening out. So it's not clear how, how much better that's going to get going forward. And I think we need a real breakthrough to get, you know, order of magnitude decreases in clean energy technologies. If you get that price differential right, all of the negative, most of the negative things I, I mentioned will go away and we'll have a huge acceleration toward clean technologies. That's a tough problem. It's going to take science, engineering, and so forth to get there. But I, I think we have to go in that direction. So there are a lot of things that, that there are a lot of policies, a lot of ideas that are out there. Um, I will just, the, 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 the air and changing climate technical advisory team that, that we were a part of, um, is we're right now going through creating this big long list of different policies that could be taken up. And that report is going to come out, it's going to be released publicly, I think sometime in November, and it's due to the state legislature December 13th. Um, and it's the idea of it is that it's going to lay out a roadmap for Utah to take action on these topics. So if you're interested in it, and it's going to have some specifics in there, and it's going to also have some general ideas. and I think the most important thing as a citizen is to, to look at those sorts of things and let your legislators know that you care about implementing those. You don't have to be an expert in all of the policies and, and which one is going to be the most effective. You know, that's for the legislators to understand and they should ask experts in the field, uh, a lot of whom are in this room. Um, but if, if, even if you don't know exactly what should be, letting them know that you care about the issue and that you I'd like to see urgent action is super important because that will engender systemic change, which is what you know individual actions are really powerful for personally for being a part of the solution and, and, and giving yourself a positive outlook. But what we need are systemic actions um, that can move our society forward. I just wanted to add that as students, another place you have a very powerful voice and a chance to make change is here on campus. And the, I think having you know, this sort of event shows that the administration is very interested in hearing what the, the community here has to say. Um, students led the Senate resolution that was passed last spring that commits the university to carbon neutrality by 2050, and there's a lot of leaders working on this right now. Um, so their students have, have a big, big role to play. So similarly to making your, your values and inspires for where it goes, not to your legislature, but also to your campus. Thank you to our panel. I think our hour is up, and thank you to all of you for listening. Thank you, and, and thank you, Brenda, for uh, moderating. Uh, we're going to transition to a, a different panel. Thank you. Uh, so thank you all once again. For the students and others, the, there are a number of seats that if you want to take the time to kind of fill in as we're transitioning to our next group, that would be great. Keith and John and Diane and everyone. How's it going, John? Thanks for organizing. Yeah. yeah.
No. What are you talking about? <laughs> I have backup. No, I have your slides. If I use the backup, they're double the numbers. I see. Right. Exactly. Paging Rob Payne. Paging Rob Payne. Ah, uh, okay. Well, as, as Rob comes in, I will I will just get us going and introduce him, even though he's uh, not right here. Uh, so this panel, as you can see, is on sci scientific cooperation, health, and environmental data, and you'll hear from a variety of different professionals that. Uh, are collecting some data uh, and combining it in interesting ways and utilizing this data to make certain decisions, whether that be in design uh, or in science. Uh, the first panelist is Keith Bartholomew, Associate Professor in City and Metropolitan Planning and part of my home college, so welcome, Keith. Uh, we have John Lynn, who is a professor in atmospheric science, Rob Payne, a professor in pulmonary pulmonary medicine, and Christopher Riley, uh, Professor Associate Director in Pharmacology and Toxicology. Uh, and then we have uh, Diane Pataki, who is the Associate Vice President of Research here at the University. And so I, with that, I will open it up to, yep. to you all. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Keith Bartholomew. I'm a, an attorney, actually, but uh, I work with architects uh, and designers, and so that means my slides must have a black background. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk just a little bit, very briefly, about uh, work that researchers in my college are doing uh, to address at least intermediary um, effects that ultimately um, impact health um, through air quality. Uh, and the lens is on design and planning and architecture. Uh, and I have three different geographic foci, and I will do this all in five minutes. Whoa. Um, I'm looking at three different scales, uh, macro, meso, and micro, just very briefly. Um, at the met metropolitan scale, which is what I, I stand in for uh, the macro scale, um, we know that planning agencies, governmental agencies around the country are concerned about air quality, they're concerned about development footprint, and they are working with their regions to try to reduce emissions and reduce other environmental impacts. Um, the slide you see here is an example from 10 years ago now of the Sacramento region where they looked at different scenarios for development into the future um, and worked with their political leaders um, to try to move towards a future development pattern more oriented to the image on the right than the one on the left. And uh, just to orient you, the orange is the development footprint. Um, the one on the left is the kind of business as usual. If the region were to continue to grow to 2050 as it has been growing for the past 20 years, that's what it would look like on the left. What they're choosing to do, however, is what's on the right. Well, it turns out that regions all over the country, um, in research that I've done, uh, I've counted at least 100 different examples at a metropolitan scale where political leaders, again, are making the choice to move ahead with a more compact future and one that is less reliant on transportation consumption. Um, the graph that you see here is a representation of 80 of those projects. And what you're seeing is a comparison in what's called vehicle miles traveled, a composite measure of transportation consumption. And it's a percentage uh, comparison of alternative scenarios compared to the base case. And you can see there are some scenarios on the left side of that graph where 
consumption actually goes up. What's really interesting is that the overwhelming percentage of the scenarios are moving to the right and transportation consumption is going down. And it's not remarkable if you have a more compact development pattern that transportation consumption goes down. We know that to be true. What's remarkable is it's political leaders who are choosing that and advancing that alternative. That has, of course, impacts on air quality. Moving to the meso level, meso scale, we also know that development patterns at a kind of project level basis can also make a big difference. Um, the developments that you see in the left-hand side of the screen are what we would classify as transit-oriented. They are moderate density, mixed use, designed to help people access nearby transit. Unfortunately, the uh, policy tools that most planners use right now, provided to us by the Institute for Transportation Engineers, treats all developments as if they're the same. We did some research, or colleagues in my college did some research, to look at what the actual transportation consumption is of those more transit-oriented developments. And what we found is that the actual on-the-ground consumption of transportation is, some, in some cases, two-thirds lower than projections are being, that are being used by um, planners today. The last scale is micro. Uh, and what this uh, slide depicts is the, the difference that a bus stop makes. We all know bus stops is coming in basically two flavors. One is called the pole in the puddle, where you have basically a flag that is somewhat cryptic, and you hope that's an indication for where the bus is going to stop. Uh, and if it's raining, it's very likely in a mud puddle, uh, and uh, that's where you wait in your well-begone state um, for the bus to pick you up. Uh, the other model is one where you have a shelter from the elements. Heaven's sakes, a place to sit. Um, not, uh, perhaps not a latte or other creature comforts, but at least you're not getting wet. Uh, we decided to calculate, is there a difference between those two different models? And it turns out there is. Um, without going into the details and, and um, describing all the data that you see there, the stops, at least in our region, that have that shelter and have that bench are getting twice the number of riders compared to a control group. And more importantly, um, those of our patrons and those of our fellow citizens who have uh, limitations in transportation, disabilities that keep them from using regular transit, they are selecting to use regular buses at almost uh, half, or excuse me, again, twice the rate um, uh, compared to control groups. And so this is a solution that's not only helping people switch for more polluting modes of transportation, but is also advancing social equity. Thank you. So my name is uh, John Lynn. I'm a professor in atmospheric sciences. So I wanted to give you a sense of the air quality data that uh, we're collecting in the work that we're doing. And this really builds off of what uh, Logan has already mentioned. But before I want to sort of dive deep into atmospheric stuff, I will just want to say how excited I am about today's event. Um, because atmospheric science is really just one discipline among many. And when I think about what's required, especially to solve this problem of air quality, really involves you know, disciplines such as chemistry, parks and recreation, economics, engineering. Um, behavioral science, health science, you know, you name it. I, actually, I venture to guess you take any discipline on campus and I bet it has a linkage to air quality. So I, I think it bodes well that we, we're in this room and uh, we have the support of the central administration to, to move forward with this dialogue. So atmospheric science, how do we think about this problem? I think for us, I think there, there are really three key components that we're trying to reduce our uncertainty on. One is weather. So when we talk about inversions, we like to call it persistent cold air pools or PCAP. But let's just use inversion for now. You know, that really is an atmospheric phenomenon. It, it determines how deep the, the mixing is and how much of the dilution the pollutants get. 
Um, the weather also determines whether there's snow or not and wind patterns. And there's fantastic colleagues in my, my department that are working on this collecting data, such as through Meadow West. Oops, movie. Um, the other two components that I'm more involved in is understanding the pollutant emissions in atmospheric chemistry. So what happens to these pollutants after you emit it to the atmosphere? There are a lot of chemistry, and actually most of our wintertime pollution and actually the summertime pollution is created secondarily. So understanding the chemistry is really quite important. So what are we doing to this respect? Um, we're establishing, we have established and continue to run a network of sites uh, in northern Utah. So we have three sites in the Uinta Basin, um, especially related to oil and gas. There's one site in Heber Valley, one in Cache, um, one at the Snowbird Tram Building, which is a fantastic site, and then this will rain down on you, lots of sites in the Salt Lake Valley. Okay, so this is part of actually a fantastic vision that's proposed by the Global Changes Sustainability Center called WIO, Wasatch Environmental Observatory. But there are other sites uh, involving water monitoring, for example, that are also part of WIO. So let's zoom in on the Salt Lake Valley now. These are our current iteration of the sites. This was actually established by none other than Diane Pataki um, right before the Winter Olympics, and it continues to this day, and it's thanks to visions of her and uh, Dave Bowling and Jim Ellinger that we have this network. But what I want to stress here is not just the science, but the partnership that this has engendered. So partnering with uh, Intermountain Health, for example, Rio Tinto or Draper, Snowbird, this has uh, allowed us to work with the community in many ways and work with these entities. Um, and it's through their partnership that we're able to measure there. Okay, another asset we have is on top of the William Browning building. This is part of the Utah Atmospheric Trace Gas and Air Quality Lab. And this is um, run by Ryan Bars right there. So Ryan, yep, if you're interested, please talk Ryan. But what we're doing is measuring greenhouse gases co-located with air quality species. Getting to what the keynote speaker mentioned earlier, um, understanding the, the potential co-benefits of reducing greenhouse gases and trying to improve air quality. And just, just a brief note on the data there, the gray bar, the, the thick one, is one of the big inversion events. And you can see all these pollutants build up together. Ooh, it's moving again, okay. Um, but um, maybe in, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll skip some of the details on the tracks measurement. This is PM2.5 that we've collected on the green and red lines, but you can really get a beautiful sense of some of the localized pollution hotspots. And it's, it's a really great platform that we continue to build and, and use. Um, there's a recent expansion now, thanks to recent funding from the state to expand in the group blue line so we can fill out some of that gap um, on the eastern part of the valley. Okay, now you heard briefly about the Google Street View cars. This is something we're really excited about. So this is a partnership with Google, of course, but also Environmental Defense Fund, or EDF. And what we're doing is, is having instruments um, in the back of the Google Street View car. So they're driving around, collecting all the beautiful imagery that you see on Google, but we're also collecting air quality data as well. So this project started in April of this year, and the hope is that it will continue um, at least until the end of this year, but hopefully to early part of next year, so covering the entire winter period. But uh, that's something that is in place, and we're collecting data, and hopefully we'll get to analyses soon. Well, finally, I want to mention a really exciting kind of uh, project that we've, we're sort of envisioning and planning for. This is with colleagues in atmospheric science, but a lot of experts on air quality across the nation, actually. So what we're trying to do is to bring two research aircraft, at least, hopefully, uh, that, that is linked with ground-based measurement and really understanding the vertical distribution, the pollution, the chemical species, the chemistry that, that creates it, and also the weather and how the weather and the chemistry are coupled to one another. So I just want to mention that this is a big effort that, that the university is leading, and uh, hopefully we will have these aircraft here in a few years in one of the winters. Okay, thank you very much.
Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak today. This is, this is really a great opportunity, and I think uh, gatherings like this uh, need to be a lot more frequent if we really want to uh, have an impact on environmental health and, and change here at the University of Utah. I'm Chris Riley. I'm a professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology in the School of Pharmacy. Um, I would like to take my time today to kind of introduce you to some of the work that we're doing in our lab and have been doing for quite some time. If I were to sort of best encapsulate what it is that we do uh, in, our, in our program, I'd, like, I'd say that we're basically a multidisciplinary group that's focused on understanding some of the chemical and molecular mechanisms or the basis by which different types of air pollutants affect uh, human health. Um, a lot of our studies are designed to define mechanisms uh, that, uh, and risks associated with the exposure to different types of pollutants that uh, occur in our environment. Obviously, it's, it's, air pollution is not just a single entity. It's composed of many different uh, source emissions that contribute to the, uh, to the soup that we occasionally see out here uh, and, and which drive adverse health effects. One of our goals is to, uh, as, as through understanding the mechanisms by which these processes occur, is to hopefully define uh, new ways in which we might be able to attenuate those effects uh, through therapeutic interventions uh, without, uh, you know, necessarily preventing uh, or all sources of emission from developing in, in the future. I think this is necessary. Um, our work, uh, if you look at sort of the graphic on the right here, is, uh, is, can be broken down into a few different areas. Um, we're interested in taking specific types of pollutants, for example, diesel exhaust, smoke emissions, uh, mining uh, wastes, uh, coal emissions, dusts generated through construction, so on and so forth, and characterize those particles, both physically and chemically and then test those against a suite of uh, pathways that we've been studying for a number of years and have identified as being potentially important in mediating some of the adverse effects of air pollution to try to de determine specifically how exposure leads to some sort of an adverse event relevant to human health. This is overlaid over two much broader types of, uh, broader types of work. One is related to precision pharmacotherapy. Is there a way that we can use drugs or develop new drugs? that could potentially be used to treat various forms of air pollutant uh, effects, uh, various air pollutant effects, sorry, uh, as a result of, of individual exposure characteristics, or, and also in drug discovery, whether or not we can identify novel molecules that can target specific pathways that are of relevance. I wanted to just summarize some of the work that we have. We have a couple uh, ongoing right now. We have two NIEHS funded grants. One is uh, fairly long standing. It was just renewed. Uh, another focuses on a specific type of injury elicited by biomass smoke. Both of these are heavily uh, focused on understanding mechanisms of, of damage uh, of different types of particles. I'd like to highlight the top uh, grant because it is highly interdisciplinary and represents what I think is, a, is an initial step towards uh, a, a very large program level uh, translational uh, type grant where we're trying to study polymorphic variants in, in asthma associated genes and link exposure to uh, elevated risks among this high risk population already. We have a few other grants that are focused on precision pharmacotherapy. You'll hear a little bit later, I believe, from uh, Dr. Decoy about an electronic asthma tracker trying to optimize the use of existing medications to treat uh, airway diseases and the effects uh, that may occur as a result of exposure to air pollution. And we have a couple of projects that are focusing on the development of, of nominal therapeutic leads uh, for treatment of, of diseases that may be mediated by trip channels. Since I've been doing this for a few years, I just wanted to kind of wrap up uh, and, and kind of put a, a a pitch out for what I think we really should shoot for here at the university in these, some of these larger program level grants. As was mentioned earlier, this is really a, a multidisciplinary field that requires input from a lot of different areas of expertise. Something we have here is, is location. Um, I think we have very unique exposure opportunities to study adverse health effects that occur as a result of different types of exposures, whether it be in the Salt Lake Valley, Vernal, K-12, 
Cache Valley where pollutants vary and therefore the health effects may vary accordingly. Um, we have incredible capabilities for measuring air pollutants and doing some speciation work uh, as been described by others. And we have really good infra infrastructure for recruitment and engagement of patients through the university hospitals and clinics, which Dr. Payne will cover as he goes through. I think we have some limitations. Um, we need to think about air pollution, not only when it's bad, but every day. And we need to really push people to turn research into action and can't d dismiss evidence. And I think really to make an impact, we need a, a much greater investment from the university to help us establish larger programs and leadership to, uh, to lead us in those directions. Finally, just uh, a discussion of resources. You'll probably hear about some of these later today, but we've developed an asthma cohort and we're actually tracking uh, asthma subjects' uh, responses as a function of air pollution. Um, and this winter we're developing ways of, uh, we'll, we'll be acquiring equipment that allows us to do exposures that can mimic some of the environmental exposures that people uh, may experience here. Um, with that, I think I'll just wrap it up and let the next panelists move forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm Rob Payne. I'm a uh, researcher and clinician in pulmonary medicine. And first of all, it's just wonderful to be here today. The, the university is doing this and that we're bringing together so many different groups. And I'm particularly excited with the number of students who've, uh, who've wandered in and glad, glad you're all here. Um, I'm going to do something a little different with my time. Um, first of all, I want to bring us um, back, George Thurston gave a wonderful talk this morning talking about the health effects and the multidisciplinary requirements, and I want to talk about challenges and opportunities. And I think it's important to, that we ground everything back in health. Years ago, Bill Clinton um, started off his, his presidential uh, run with the notion that it's the economy, stupid, trying to bring everybody back to saying the economy is what you had to deal with. I think using different language, I would say that, yes, it's about health. The thing that's going to drive this whole conversation is if we keep bringing people back to health, bringing the economy, the economic aspects, the social aspects, but bringing it back to health. And I put up just one slide George showed earlier of the six city studies. This is a slide that looks at different cities and compared chronic air pollution levels with mortality rates. And there's a very nice linear relationship that a non-scientist can appreciate very clearly that says, you know, you live in a place where the air quality is worse and your mortality rate's higher. And this holds up. We've looked at it a gazillion different ways, and the data is really solid. This is a more recent paper from just this year. And it's doing a similar sort of thing, but instead of looking at long-term air pollution, it's looking at air quality for two days before somebody dies. And that graph shows that the worse the air quality, the higher the particulate pollution levels are in the, over a rolling two-day average, the increased risk of mortality. And the vertical lines you can see, we, we have a range from zero up to 150, and there are lots of different regulatory agencies that say, oh, use this, use that. But the important thing is there's a steady relationship through the whole range and the steepest part of the curve is down at the bottom. So if we can make changes in air quality here day in, day out, we can really change health effects. And it's important as we hold all these conversations, we keep coming back to this. Now, I, um, I actually didn't mean to steal a slide from George, but I took one from one of his papers. Because this co comes now to our challenge and opportunity, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing here at the university. So you breathe in particles and they get into your lungs, and somehow they do many things to multiple organ systems. And we're studying many of these things at the university now. Cheryl Perosi talked about lung cancer, uh, sorry, about uh, pneumonia. There's work on lung cancer. There's work on COPD. There's work on asthma that Chris Riley was just referring to. So the university is doing a great deal about pulmonary effects of air quality. We're also seeing that air pollution impacts diabetes, bone metabolism, 
it impacts vascular function. We have researchers here who are looking at changes in vascular responses due to sm really very small changes in air quality. There are tremendously important neurologic effects, uh, both in terms of stroke, mental decay, and uh, depression. And we've got Amanda Bakian has been doing work on this that's really made quite a big splash. There's a lot of cardiovascular work, how those particles impact heart attacks. They get into the lungs, but they impact heart attacks. And there's some seminal work from uh, this valley that was shown that if you increase PM 2.5 by about 10 micrograms per cubic meter, you increase the rate of heart attacks by about 4%. It's a really major effect. And then recent work that's been coming out on premature births. It was alluded to earlier today. If, if air quality leads to premature births, you not only have the impact on that individual, on that family, but you've got social and economic impact that lasts over the entire life of the individual. This is all a big deal. Now, it's easy to talk about air pollution causes health effects. We've got a pretty simple diagram. The problem is it's a complicated path from one to the other. And what we're, what we're trying to do is actually study that path and not just get to lunch. <laughs> I know you want to. I know you want to get to Somewhere lunch. <laughs> Can you find me back where I was? Yes, right there. Oh, I don't I, know. I, it didn't like the arrow, the particular yeah. arrow I used. There you go. Use that. Okay. Down arrow. Use that down arrow. Okay. So that we. Nope. <laughs> it, it's me. It's Must be you. you. I guess. Let's see. I'll try. Try side. Maybe. Here we go. Just that one. That I little, that. That little I did path. that. Just once. Just once. Okay. A bunch of diff different emissions. We study what those emissions are and the relative contributions. They get into the atmosphere. You've been hearing from John Lynn about how we're able to monitor all this and understand the atmospheric chemistry. But by the way, we assume everybody gets the same exposure. They don't. We need to be understanding at the individual level. It then gets into the lungs and somehow we don't know how the, what happens in the lungs impacts the entire body. Oxidative stress, yes, but how does it target? And the fact is, it, it, through all those organs, and it all links up with host factors. We have the Utah Population Database here that provides an enormous understanding of different families, how those host factors come into play, how age comes into play. And this gives you the health consequences. And oh, by the way, the health consequences have tremendous costs for the society. We have to understand changes in quality of life, days lost from work. We're degrading our workforce by problems with air pollution. And all of this is a tremendous opportunity. But when you look at this path, you can't do it with one scientist, with one scientific group that's within a silo. And, we ha and our challenge is to find better ways to come together and actually learn each other's science, work together, and to be able to solve these problems as a group, not as um, not from indiv individual disciplines. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. that's led you to see 
project called Blue Track uh, in the HQ in the uh, title, in that acronym is Air Quality, um, because of this intuitive understanding that where we live, where we work, and how we get between those two and other destinations matters. And it matters for a lot of reasons, um, but one of the first things that we think of is air quality, because uh, transportation now is the um, single uh, largest um, sector of the economy that's contributing to our air quality problems. Uh, and so the work that I've been engaged with and many of my colleagues is, is been constantly in search of how do we kind of, uh, connect those dots? How do we bring in uh, atmospheric scientists and others who can kind of translate some of the transportation outcomes that we see into specific, uh, uncomprehensible um, air quality information that the public will find compelling. And that's always the, the, the key, is how do we tell this story in a way that it makes people motivated to make other cha uh, choices and other options. Definitely had to talk to a lot of different disciplines for my work, and I'll, I'll just highlight one aspect of which is understanding the mission of the coalition. So, a lot of our activities do emit pollutants from driving to what we're doing at home. So just to give you one example of how that has, has influenced my work, um, one analysis I'm trying to do is to understand future emissions of carbon from this to housing. So what does that mean? We need to know what the future urban structure is. So we've been talking to folks from your college, actually, to understand the urban form of the picture that we show what exactly will be the future development. Also, we've been talking to transportation people, a lot of from the regional council, trying to use their data, their analysis of future uh, vehicle traffic. Um, as part of that analysis, we need to also understand what future buildings will be. So we've had to talk to engineers about you know, what are the kind of buildings and the, the kind of retrofits you could do to current buildings in terms of improved insulation or um, power, what, what are the power requirements for, for heating and cooling, for instance. So I think that's just one example that there are many others that you can probably think about. Uh, yeah. so, so my training, I'm a toxicologist, which if anybody understands or knows what that is, basically what, we're, what we study and what we're interested in studying is the interaction of, of chemicals systems. Um, pharmacology is for beneficial purposes, therapeutic development, for example. Toxicology is for adverse effects. By nature, this is a very highly interdisciplinary field uh, that requires you to understand chemistry, biology, physiology, um, and, and many other uh, disciplines to some degree, but we're not necessarily a master of anything. Um, my group is, is actually quite diverse in that we use a lot of different techniques to study the, the problems that we study and to answer some of the questions that we have about how air pollutants that are complex mixtures interact with specific biological pathways to cause certain outcomes to occur. However, really in order to have an impact and, and move beyond being able to do the experiments that we do in a dish, for example, with cultured wound cells, I've, I've really reached out made it a, 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 you know, a priority to reach out to people, for example, at Dr. Green's group, people in primary children's hospital that, that study asthma and, and treat kids with asthma that are part of our study now, um, interacting with Carrie Kelly and, and other people in engineering who have the ability to, to you know, measure air, air quality at, at a fairly precise level that allow us to really take some of our hopefully meaningful you know, discoveries that are made dishes and, and translate those out to, you know, something bigger, human population, such that maybe there, there is benefit. So knowledge gaps, uh, you know, the biggest gap is, is not knowing what other people do um, and how we could work together to kind of address these, these complex problems. Uh, this is a, a wonderful area for collaboration, but collaboration is so essential. So we look at, you know, this, this is our laboratory. Not only knowing about the individual, but about that. 
into your perspective in solving our air quality problem. Uh, one of the biggest uncertainties was alluded to earlier today, and that is we talk about particles, and all particles are the same. And we actually don't understand the particular particles and the individuals who are uh, exposed to your measuring. Solving the problem, obviously, uh, that's sort of the second part of your question. Um, it's, it's just accountability, right? You know, it's, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to do all the health science research that we're doing and understand it. Um, but really, the challenge is, is making change. Um, and, and that has to start with each one of us individually. Uh, you know, if you're affected by air pollutants, understand what your exposures are, understand what your lifestyle choices are, and your changes to those levels. Even if you're not, you know, obviously you're affecting other people. Um, and then obviously pay attention to the issue. If it's a priority for you, uh, you know, vote for officials that are willing to stand up for the causes that you believe in. Uh, this being an important one. So for the uncertainty, I'll go back to the three that I highlighted in your talk. Um, so we'll start with the weather. And so it's a fundamental atmosphere problem in terms of weather forecast. Once you add air quality to that, that's, that's sort of going to be a different dimension of complexity. So imagine we're able to predict tomorrow's air quality, so the winter time, at hourly levels, which is very precise kind of uh, uh, accuracy. And I think that's quite transformative. And I think that, that is something that many people are working towards, but I think there's improvements that, that are needed. Now that there's, there's emissions, so there are many emissions that need to accommodate. Not and POCs to two hundred. There's still a lot of uncertainty, and I'll throw in ammonia. Ammonia nitrate being our, our main uh, kind of composition of, of uh, winter complexity. So there's still some pretty basic questions that we need to answer. Um, and then the third, of course, is the energy. So there's some the work I've been involved in. We're still understanding should we control NOx or VOCs? Um, and you have non linear effects that sort of pop up because of the contract. So, again, those three that I'll highlight. I think the biggest gap in seeing real change, real results, is uh, one of leadership. And uh, we know from uh, sociological uh, research some of the parameters that need to be observed. Uh, to achieve social change. Uh, the, the, the stumbling block is uh, how do we implement it? How do we actually put those into practice? Um, because uh, as, as Chris said, we absolutely, uh, this comes down to an individual choice. And while systemic change has to happen, the, the, rarely does the system change before individuals change. It's usually the other way around. Individuals change first and then the system changes to catch up. And so I, I think you know more research and kind of social science research looking at what is necessary for making the individual transformation so that when we have meetings like this and the first question is how did you arrive today, um, that first bar representing you know individual personal automotive transportation is a lot smaller. That's the goal. We want to get the next meeting to get that bar shrunk. So I actually um, agree and started answering about scientific collaboration from the gas system. But I want to think that the biggest gap I see in terms of change is actually the research on how we make the behavioral change when it requires long-term vision. And I, I was excited about the first panel with the conversation that 
we'll translate research into action and scientific engagement sort of the theme today. So let's talk about that. Um, how do you engage the public or decision makers or policy makers in either your data collection or communicating your results? Well, the work that I personally do is all based on data that are uh, collected by public agencies, the transportation agencies. So I'm working with uh, the um, organizations in our governmental structure that are actually providing services or making investments on, on transportation infrastructure. And they, they collect lots of data, and that data is very helpful in the work that I do. But it also, as I suggested in my talk, uh, are indicative of how they're thinking. And so I get a window, not just, just in what they're observing, but what they prioritize by what they are, are observing. And so uh, I think those kinds of collaborations, um, to the extent that we can extend those and expand those, I think that's very helpful. Uh, because our implementing government agencies out there like to know that they have kind of the backing of the, kind of the research muscle of an R1 university behind them. And I know that that's been kind of John's experience and that's been working track. Yeah, so I think the, the action for for me, has been a lot of uh, outreach and also education. So uh, another thing is to make the data visible. And so you could uh, look at the data in real time. And that's true for a lot of people in the industry. Um, um, you could go to, for example, here by you saw that meter and post our data pretty much in real time. I think that's very powerful because you can see the phenomena if you have a version of that concentration. Another is um, just engaging with people on campus. So I mentioned the, the lab on top of the US Tech lab. And I um, invite you to just drop by because we have um, glass in the US here, not there. You can peek in and see the instruments at work. We have the data posted in um, an interactive kind of uh, fresh meet, so it's sort of science in action. Um, and also, um, I like to go to school. <laughs> Talked about the future generation, and they could be as young as Hawthorne Elementary, and, and engage them, and uh, helping talk to their parents. So, so all these kinds of things. Uh, how do I engage public and policy makers in communicating the results? The reality is, I don't. Um, I'm a scientist, and I spend a lot of time in the lab doing really interesting stuff, and I tend to present it at meetings where there are a lot of people like me that do interesting science and have interesting results and we publish and we, we all think we're doing something important within our group. Um, <laughs> the reality is uh, it needs to be bigger than that. I've, I've had the opportunity to serve on NIHS, NIHS review panels for program project grants and, and training grants for several years now and, and all of these all these programs have, you know, extensive community outreach uh, components of the grant, uh, which I think are essential for, for really getting the word out to the public so that they understand what the science is telling us about, about the risks of air quality in your outdoor, whichever you wish. But um, self-assessment on that, I, I'd say I'm failing at that at this point, and I'd be happy to work with anybody here to try to improve upon that. Uh, there, I've been very fortunate with Dr. Lee's engagement. Um, we're fortunate in Salt Lake City, our, our newspaper, our public radio stations have very active environmental uh, reporting groups, and they reach out and talk to a number of us about what affects air pollution. And that's been a little scary, but I think as Dr. Thurston pointed out, they typically treat you well and make 
teaching students, I think we do have a lot of students in the audience, and I'd love to have a couple of opportunities for questions. So let's take some questions from the audience. social and climate regarding the environment and medicine, how would one teach a large amount of uneducated people, teach, influence, motivate them to uh, support the idea, all your hard work has shown that health is affected by air pollution civilly and not in a way that will scare them to move away. Disciplines in my college, architecture and planning, are uh, kind of on the front lines of a lot of this stuff. And uh, I tell my planning students that their job is to be simultaneously uh, Chicken Little and Pollyanna, um, because uh, it is their kind of professional duty to recognize and to be able to communicate effectively the uh, enormity of the moment, the, the magnitude of the challenge. And, uh, and also the ability to uh, uh, act effectively to address it. And that's their, that is their challenge. And we see professionals in the building trades of various types, not just architecture and planning, but including those, who are taking the science and taking the knowledge that we generate at a university like this and to put it into actual practice on the ground and then see real change, see real differences. Um, and so I, I think that's the hopeful message. Is yes, this is important. You can't ignore it. You have to pay attention to it. And there are effective ways to do that. And they are proven. It's not, I'm, I'm afraid, it's not rocket science. It's actually pretty simple stuff. Um, and that's hopeful. There was another question. Okay. Well, yes, I want to know what your thoughts are about the inland. 
I'll take that one on. <laughs> uh, not knowing uh, as much as I would like to about the England Court, I do have several observations. One, uh, the, uh, the amount of pollution that comes out of uh, our shipping our transportation is, is pretty substantial. And uh, the bunker fuel that is um, that is burned in those vessels um, is causing severe health consequences for the neighborhoods that surround those ports. And so uh, to the extent that uh, a off-site facility is reducing, has the potential for reducing those emissions, that's, that's interesting to me, and I think it has some important social equity dimensions to it. Whether a, a mountain, high mountain bowl is the best place to, to have that facility is a different question, and I'm not so sure about that. Um, I think that there are ways of accommodating that kind of infrastructure that could mitigate or minimize um, negative, localized air quality impacts. Uh, but it would take, again, leadership. It would take leadership uh, by the state to say this facility will be designed and constructed and operated in such a way that it would have zero emissions, for example. Um, that it, it, and it could be done. The technology is there. It's, it's not that it's impossible, it's not a huge overreach. Um, but it's, um, it takes someone saying that's what our goal is. Well, planning uh, is uh, a tool, and it can be used in a variety of different fashions. Um, the experience of Utah in uh, using planning has been very different from other places, uh, places such as Portland, uh, which is regularly held up as, a, as an example of maybe a more progressive way to do planning. I think the, the chief issue is uh, one of Fitness. Ian McCart, uh, the um, landscape architect, said that we need to pay attention to where we have interventions or interactions with the landscape, and because not all the lands are the same. And we need to uh, choose those places where we decide to have an impact by, through development, um, by their relative fitness to accommodate that type of development, that type of growth. Um, one of the big issues, and I was represented in the slides I showed, is just development footprint and how compact or spread out the development pattern is, is going to be a important uh, driver, sorry for the pun, of uh, transportation uh, consumption. Uh, and so uh, 
when I, I look at our development challenges and our air quality challenges, I'm looking at that footprint. How much are we spreading out? And so we... Well, I think so, or just being smarter about where we develop. Unfortunately, we have a kind of an odd regulatory system where we, are, we tend to uh, restrict development in the central uh, places, central locations of our region, and to allow development more, more freely out of the fringes. And that's exactly opposite what you would want to see if you were trying to engage planning to improve air quality. You would actually want to be suppressing growth at the fringes and encouraging growth and development in the central areas. And there are places that do that. And they make huge differences in how people choose to travel. And that, of course, has impacts on health and air quality. Thank you. We do need to break for lunch, so let's thank all of the panelists. Thank you all. Before you go get your lunch, I want to uh, introduce uh, Lori Meekham from the Global Change and Sustainability Center that will give you some uh, strategies to increase uh, our understanding and connection with others during lunch. Thanks. You want to know what to do, and I'm going to tell you, and then you're going to do it, and then this great work will continue. So what is easy in a gathering like this is to either, one, be a wallflower and don't talk to anybody, or two, talk to the people that you know. That's not what we're going to do next. What we're going to do is the following. Um, you're going to grab your lunch, which is out in the hall. When you come back, you're not going to sit where you're sitting now. You're going to grab your backpack and your jacket, and you're going to mix it up in here. Because what we're talking about is creating these new connections, right? And you might be a technical expert, and there are people here that want to hear from you. You might uh, be a community member, and you want and you have questions. So uh, the name tags have different colors on them, and we're going to create rainbows at, this, at the table. So if you're a community member, um, your name tag is yellow. And if you made your own name tag, remember this color because you know who you are. If you're in the health sciences, your, uh, your little swirl on your name tag is green. Main campus is blue. Staff, administration people are red. Students are purple. So when you come back with your lunch, make a rainbow at the table. Um, figure out who's at the table. And, I, and we're going to bring you some little notepads. We want each table to come up with questions that you of you researchers could explore to help solve these big vexing problems. Okay, are you with me to do this? This is so good. You guys are so awesome. Um, uh, P.S. Lunch, uh, there are, uh, if you registered, if you requested a gluten-free lunch when you registered, um, ask the staff. They're not on the regular table. So you should have time to lunch, move, make a rainbow, um, come up with some really awesome questions, which we'll collect and post. And then you still have a chance to check in with that person that you want to talk to. Okay? Do it.